Hey, James. hey Laura, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, I'm very good, thank you. So good to meet you. Great to meet you too. Thank oh my you God. so much for giving me some time here. I really, really appreciate it. How I are you? Say, how are you feeling? Great. I'm envious right now of your, your podcast studio decor over there. <laughs> <laughs> nice little setup here. <laughs> I am hypnotized as we speak. The rest of the room's an absolute mess. So <laughs> Actually, <laughs> like, it only too. looks good here. The rest of it's just yeah, stuff everywhere. Good. Yeah. yeah, no, it's funny. I was just thinking that I need something like right up in this space. And you are definitely, I mean, <laughs> yeah, go, go big, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I know we've not met before, Laura, but like you're so passionate about what you do. Every interview I've watched of you, every podcast I've listened to, the time and the effort and the, and the work that you do at the Wrongful Conviction Centre is, is incredible. Um, could you please tell people how long that's been going for and, and how long you've been you've been doing that and, and a little bit about your background? Yeah, I'd be glad to. And thanks so much, James, for, for having me on. I'm thrilled to be on. And, you know, it's stuff I love to talk about and I love to hear what people think about. And so I'm, I'm just so happy <laughs> to be here. Um, let me, I'll, t- I'll start by telling you a story um, about how I got into this work. Um, I've been representing people who've been convicted of crimes they didn't commit for about 14 years now, right? I co-direct the Center on Wrongful Convictions, which is part of Northwestern University here in Chicago. So I teach at a law school. My students work on my cases with me. And together, our center has exonerated close to 50 innocent men, women, and children over the course of our work and, and freed a lot more who at least we were able to secure them their freedom. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a specialized area of work. There's only a couple hundred lawyers in the country, in the U S who do this kind of work. Right. Um, so how did I get into it is, is a story I always like to tell. Um, so for me, right. I was in law school 15 years ago. Um, and I was in my last year of law school. I was a student here at Northwestern university in Chicago, where I now teach. And I thought I had my whole life figured out, right? I was going to be a business lawyer. <laughs> That's what I was going to do. I was what the hell happened? <laughs> I was going to sue people and write contracts. Do not judge me. That was my plan, right? And, <laughs> and I'm in my last year of law school and I had like my life figured out. I had my job lined up. After graduation, I was going to go to a big law firm and I'm going to do this, right? And so on a complete whim, my last year of law school, I decided to start taking classes that were off the beaten path, right? Stuff I knew nothing about. And I ended up signing up for a class taught by Steve Drizzen on wrongful convictions. And it just so happened that this was four months after a young man in Wisconsin had just been convicted of a very high profile rape and murder. A young man named Brendan Dassey whose story many years later would go on to be featured in, in the Netflix series, Making a Murderer. And it just so happened that four, year, four months before I signed up for this class, my professor, Steve, had agreed to represent Brendan on his appeal, right? And I had no idea of any of this. So I walk into this class and Steve calls me into his office, my professor, he's now my, my co-director, now my close and dear colleague. But at the time he was my professor, he calls me into his office, you know, and he's like, okay, I've just gotten involved in this case out of Wisconsin involving a 16 year old special education student who confessed to a murder that I don't think he committed. Mm. And he handed me, right, the interrogation videos of Brendan Dassey, which again, like 10 years later, the world would watch him making a murder. Yeah. And he handed me these things. And he told me to go home and watch them. So I go home, I sit down on my couch. Now these are like DVDs, cause this is 2007. <laughs> and so I put these DVDs into my laptop, right? And I watched these things, the interrogation videos, I watched them for hours. And, um, you know, my heart broke. Yeah. Because you see two seasoned adult investigators manipulating a scared 16 year old boy into confessing to a murder that he couldn't even describe. And that was the moment that I knew I, I couldn't, I couldn't walk away. Right. Yeah, I couldn't like, so that, was it. Down. that was it. That was it. So I did yeah. graduate fortunately, but yeah. I did not, did not go into business law. I was lucky yeah. to have a chance to stay at Northwestern and build the center on wrongful convictions with Steve, who's now my dear longtime colleague, where we have been representing Brendan and a lot of other kids just like him ever That's since. That's amazing. That's absolutely incredible. And 
obviously we're going to, we're going to talk about Brendan, but I think, I think I'm sure almost everyone who is watching and listening will wonder to themselves, why would anyone confess to a crime they didn't commit? It doesn't make any sense, but so many people do. Why, why is this happening? It's such a good question. And you're right. That is the big question because all of us, right. Think, well, geez, I would never do that. That doesn't make any sense. Right. So why would anyone do it? Um, and this is one of the questions that actually drew me into this work because I started asking exactly, exactly the same question, right? Like, why would anyone do this? Turns out that we know of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people across the United States who have confessed to crimes that later DNA proved they didn't commit, often 10 or 15 years later proved that they didn't commit, right? So we know this happens at like this crazy rate way more often than anyone would think. Hmm. And, and it's under circumstances that are different than we would think. I mean, I, I do think most people understand that if you're being tortured, right, or like physically abused, then you might confess to a crime. You might just say you did it to make the abuse stop, right? Um, but in these cases, in these hundreds of cases where DNA proved people innocent, when you look at the videotapes, where there are videotapes of the interrogation, you see that they were being questioned using only psychological techniques. Right? No one's laying a finger on these people. It's just a psychological mind game of the interrogation room that is, is producing these false confessions. And that's part of what I find totally fascinating about the space. Is it's like when a suspect is brought into the interrogation room, the name of the game is using these psychological tactics to so completely manipulate, deceive uh, the suspect, to completely turn their world on its head so that all of a sudden in your mind, or eventually in your mind after hours, it starts to make sense to you mm. to confess to a crime, even if you're innocent, right? So when you watch these, these interrogation tapes and, and we you know, play a lot of them in our podcast, Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions, you can hear this from real cases happening. You, know, you, you have people being brought into the interrogation room, being told, that the case against them is rock solid, right? We know you committed this murder. We've got all the evidence in the world against you. I've got your DNA. I found your DNA at the crime scene. I found your fingerprints on the gun, right? I've got three witnesses in the room next door who picked you out of a lineup, whatever, right? The case against you is rock solid. This is what they're told, even if that's not true, right? In, in the United States, police are allowed to lie about the evidence against a suspect. Right. Mm. So this happens in the interrogation room. You are told that no one's going to believe you're innocent. They have all this evidence against you, you know, and picture, imagine that's you hearing that after a while, you're going to start thinking to yourself, I don't know how they have my DNA. I don't know how they have my fingerprints. I've never been to this crime scene, but this guy really thinks I'm guilty. His whole department, he's telling me things I'm guilty. You know, the prosecutor is going to think I'm guilty. This is some horrific mistake, but I'm, I'm really screwed here. What am I going to do? Right. Um, and that's so, the point at which, yeah, that's the point at which they sort of say, well, if you confess, it'll help. It'll so, help it, so, in, it, so in the States, if you get, so basically you get pulled in for questioning, they say, Laura, look, I know your DNA is on this weapon, um, right. whatever technique there is, but they're using that as a technique to get a confession, even if it's not true. And you're allowed to, they're allowed to do that. Well, this is how they're taught, right? This is how police are taught in the United States and overseas in many places too. This is how they're taught to do it. Right? right, they're taught to use these techniques, and you know, the goal of interrogation is to get a confession. It's that's another really important thing. The goal of interrogation is not to learn whether or not someone did it. Right, police are trained to interrogate only if they they believe you to be guilty already. So the whole goal of interrogation is just to get that statement. Yeah. Right. So they're trained to use all of these deceptive tactics that it's okay to lie about the evidence because you already, in theory, believe this person is guilty. You're just trying to do whatever it takes to get that statement. But, you know, like the trick of all that is that if you need a confession, if you need to go through all of this psychological manipulation, this, this really hard and awful process of interrogation to get a confession, it means the case wasn't strong enough on its own without the confession, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the catch-22 here. So Laura, on the on the flip side to that is how do we make sure the police, you know, the courts, you know, that, that they're convicting the people who are actually guilty? Which is really, really important, right? And if those of us who represent people who have been wrongfully convicted, a big part of what our job is, is not only proving the innocence of our clients, hmm. but 
as we do that, often we end up identifying the real perpetrator along the way, right? We've had many, many cases, all of us who practice this, this kind of work where you, you, you know, have somebody come to you, I was convicted of this rape and murder 20 years ago, please test the DNA, you'll see it wasn't me, you test the DNA, it's not them, and it turns out the DNA belongs to some serial offender who's been out there re-offending while the innocent person, right, was, was doing that guy's time behind bars, wrongly, you know? So, so there's a real public safety argument, in my opinion, for overturning, you know, overturning wrongful convictions and, and revisiting these cases and making sure we've got it right. Yeah. You know, I think that's what everybody wants. And, you know, that's why we're so proud in our work. We partner a lot with law enforcement, right? We yeah, want to yeah. learn from these interrogations where, where these psychological techniques go wrong. We want to work together and, and have, I think, been really successful working with some leading police training organizations in the country. Like, let's change the way we interrogate. So we get true confessions, so we still solve crimes, keep the streets safe, but just avoid causing Brendan Dassey situations. Yeah. Like those are airplane crashes of a nightmare situation. And, Which I'm sure are still that. going on. I'm sure you're still seeing this now, even now. You know, that obviously the, the Brendan case was what, 2007? He confessed in 2006. Yeah. 2006. Yeah. So we're talking yeah. you know, a long time ago. And I bet yeah. you're still seeing cases now in 2022, same sort of, same sort of things. Just happened three weeks ago, north of Chicago. It was uh, in the Washington Post and a couple of other big outlets across the United States. A 15-year-old kid was accused of a shooting. He's brought in for questioning. He eventually confesses uh, to participating in the shooting, right? He's arrested, booked, charged with first-degree murder. And thank God for him, someone in his class comes forward, I think, with a Snapchat video of him at a basketball game at the exact time the murder happened. So he only, you know, fortunately for him, he had to go through the trauma of the interrogation, but he was able to be released after just two, day, two days because of mm. this video. Thank God, right? Somebody yeah, had that yeah, yeah. forward. But yeah, it happens all the time. It's, you know, that's just the most recent example. And another thing I was reading about is that it, only since sort of 2010, um, interrogations were recorded. So they haven't actually been recorded prior to 2010. So you must think about all the false confessions that people have given that are not on tape. And they just don't exist. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, right? That's been a, a reform that's been gradually started out slow and has now become a wave. So the first uh, first states to require recording, you know, something like 25 years ago, the very, very first requirements came out. Um, and now we're up to 30 states that require interrogations to be videotaped, which unfortunately means there's still 20 that don't. Yeah. You know, that's still, we need to work on that. <laughs> we need to work on that, exactly. Yeah, it's like you yeah. go into that room and whatever happens in there stays in there. And that's a scary yeah. thing, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, it's crazy, actually. Wisconsin, um, in 2005, adopted a rule requiring kids' interrogations to be recorded. And right. Brendan's, as it just so happened, was one of the very first... Um, murder interrogations to be recorded under that law. I mean, just imagine if we didn't have that recording, right? Oh, Brendan comes out of that room and, try, and tries, especially with his, his intellectual disabilities to express what just happened to him. You know, yeah. if he could manage to communicate it, no one would believe him. That, and that's the heartbreaker. Well, let, let's talk about Brendan because the case is, is, you know, it's obviously famous around the world from, from the documentary Making a Murder. I'm sure everyone who's watching and, and listening will have seen it. And if you haven't, please do, because it's, it's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. I and mean, it's just amazing. Um, Brendan, it, there's so many things I want to ask. Let's, let's go back to the start. When did this happen? And, and can you please talk us through the timeline of that? Yeah, yeah. So Teresa Halbach disappeared on October 31st, 2005, right? And there was a search pretty soon after that, within a few days at the Avery salvage yard because that was one of the places she had last been seen or last, that was sort of one of the last appointments on her daily calendar was to go out to that salvage yard and take a, a photograph of a car that was for sale. She was a professional photographer. And so she disappears on October 31st, 2005. There's a search at the, at the Avery salvage yard. And of course, as people who remember the series will know, Law enforcement, um, within a few days, said they found a number of pieces of physical evidence, right, uh, that they said linked to Stephen Avery. They found Teresa Halbach's car, so they said, amongst the junked cars on the salvage yard, they, there were blood evidence that they found, things like that. So, you know, and of course, her, her remains, horrifically, mm -hmm. her, her badly burned remains, um, were also found on the property. So Stephen Avery was arrested within a few 
days of her disappearance, really within about a week of her disappearance. Right. Um, but Brandon was a different story, right? Brandon wasn't arrested until, gosh, well, he was arrested on March 1st, 2006. So if my math's right, that's five months later, right? Yeah. Brandon lived on that salvage <clears throat> yard too. The whole family did. Stephen Avery had a trailer. Brandon and his mom and his brothers had another trailer. The grandparents had another trailer. The whole family lived there. And of course, you can imagine, right? What, at the time of Stephen's arrest, the whole family was questioned by police. Did you see anything? What do you know? Et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, and, and then Brennan was basically left alone mm. for five months until the police came back to him uh, in late February, 2006, months after Stephen's arrest. Um, in part because one of Brendan's cousins, a young, young girl, had told the police that Brendan had been upset and crying a lot lately. Which so you that know, was the only reason. 16-year-old kid. Yeah, there's no physical, you know, they scoured that salvage yard from top to bottom. They, you know, produce all this physical evidence that they say links Stephen Avery to the case. Not a single shred of physical evidence. No one is implicating Brendan Dassey. Right. Um, but they're looking to strengthen their story against Stephen. Yeah. And so when they hear that Brendan's been crying, right, um, they show up at his high school unannounced on February 26th. He's 16 years old. He's in the 10th grade, a special education student, right, with severe language disabilities. That's where his disabilities have to do with how he can speak. Mm. You know, they, they inhibit his ability to take in information that is spoken to him and then to, to, you know, to respond, to communicate back. So they show up at his high school on February 27th, um, unannounced, his parents, his mom has no idea that they're there, which is perfectly legal in Wisconsin for the police to just show up in the question your kid at school. They bring him down to the principal's office. They accuse him of knowing more than he's saying about Teresa Halbach's disappearance and his family's involvement in it. They tell him falsely that the district attorney, remember Ken Kratz, right? They tell yeah, him yeah, falsely yeah. that the district attorney is looking at charging Brendan unless he fills in the blanks for them with information that makes him look a little bad. These are all direct quotes, right? You got to fill in the blanks with information that makes you, Brendan, look a little bad or else you're going to get charged with having something to do, maybe covering up, right? The Teresa Halbach murder. You can imagine, right? This is like out of the blue for Brendan. There's no evidence against him. No one's accused him of anything, right? He's there alone, 16 years old, special ed student, scared out of his mind. Mm. And he starts trying to satisfy these, these two men that are in his face, asking for information, demanding information, and threatening him with being arrested if he doesn't sort of tell them things, fill in those blanks. He starts, you know, making up a story. Yeah. And that, that process of making things up and repeating the story that he's told to repeat, you know, goes on and off for interrogations over the next 48 hours until on March 1st, two days later, he ends up giving the interrogators what they ask him to say, which is a statement in which he helped his uncle rape and murder Teresa Halbach, even though he's not able to get anything right. He's not able to accurately describe how she was killed. You know, the forensics evidence was that she was shot in the head. Um, but Brendan wasn't able to come up with that. He, he guessed this long line of all the different ways he could think of, of killing someone. It, and at one point even said, you know, did we kill her by stabbing? Did we kill her by choking? Did we kill her by cutting off her hair? You know, this is not a kid who, who was getting yeah. the answer right. He finally had to be told, right, that, that she was shot in the head, which he then repeated back. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most unreliable confessions I've ever seen in my many years of representing people who've confessed to crimes they didn't commit. Forget the, the cases, a famous case for a second. If we just put that to, to one side, just on a, on a human level, how can any judge, police officer, court see that and think that's evidence that they can use and to convict a 16-year-old? That's exactly the right question, right? And that's the problem here is what... Those tapes show, right, what the world saw on Making a Murderer, what I saw when I was a law student. You don't have to be a lawyer to get that that's wrong, yeah. right? It hits you at this gut level. Of course it's wrong. It's obvious. But the problem is that as, as the courts ultimately ruled in Brendan's case is that those tactics 
that the officers used on him are not clearly illegal. Hmm. That's the problem. What the law prohibits does not correspond to our sort of normal human sense of right and wrong, right? So that's, and that's exactly why Brendan Dassey ended up losing after we won his federal appeal twice. That third round, we lost by a single vote because the court said, look, you know, as many qualms as we have about this tape, as unreliable as we think this confession may be, what they did was just not clearly illegal. It just wasn't clearly illegal. So we can't overturn the conviction. And when was the, as I remember this happening, he was going to come home at Christmas. Was it, how, what year was that? Sorry. That was, let's see, was that 2017 or 2018? It's one of those two years in there. And just so, kind of a flurry. so not long. So three or four years ago, he was almost home. Yeah. This was by one, one vote from a, from a judge. Yeah. So it was about six months after, um, it was in 2016 that we won the first time, his federal right. appeal, right? And so this judge in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, writes this huge opinion saying this confession is complete bullshit, yeah. right? Nobody should believe it. This kid doesn't pose a danger to anyone. And I use the word kid by that point, Brendan was, was in his late twenties. Mm. Um, you know, he needs to go home now. This huge opinion ordering Brendan's release. The state blocked his release and appealed that decision. We argued out the appeal at the federal appeals court, which is here in Chicago. We won that appeal. Um, and again, you know, Brendan comes within 12 hours of being released and he's the sweetest, most generous soul you can imagine, right? He's there thinking he's gonna go home and he gives away to the other inmates, all the, you know, possessions that he's gathered, pens, pencils, notebooks, that kind of thing that he's accumulated over the years behind bars. Um, his blanket, you know, he's, he gives it away to the other inmates because he doesn't, you know, he wants to make sure that they're taken care of as best as he can after he, after he leaves. So he came within about 12 hours of his release. Again, the state filed a motion to block it um, and asked for a very special, very unusual third round of an appeal called an en banc appeal, where you throw out the old appeal and redo it in front of a larger group of judges. Right. Um, and that's, you know, the kind of thing that happens only in one out of every 680 cases. And they agreed to do it in Brendan's case, and they threw out his victory by a single vote. Again, not because they thought he was guilty, right? Not because they thought the confession was true, but because the law made, made it so that the only question they were allowed to consider was whether the police officer's conduct was illegal. Mm. And they said, look, it's just not clearly illegal, whatever we may think of it as human beings. And when I listened to him on on the wrongful conviction podcast that you did with with him in the interview, yeah. how the hell does he stay even remotely positive? Like he's such a he comes across such a sweet man now. You know, he's there was 31, 32, and he's just so positive and upbeat. And I want to help people. He keeps talking about helping and all of these things. And I go, he's been in prison half his life for a crime yeah. he clearly didn't commit. Right. That's right. And he has been in prison half his life. He's now 32 years old. Mm. So oh, anyone and when he was 16. So that's mm -hmm. right. And, you know, thank you for saying that, actually, because that's what you heard there <laughs> is exactly who Brendan is. Yeah. Right. That's unscripted. Brendan Dassey. He is one of the kindest, you know, gentlest, uh, you know, men I know. He's, he's funny. He's got a great sense of humor. He wants to take care of the people around him that he cares about. And him giving away his possessions is a great example of that. You know, mm. he, um, he has his jobs right at the prison. He, he works behind bars right now. His job is he helps cleaning the bathroom, mm. um, scrubbing the bathroom. And whereas you can imagine a lot of people would complain about that job. He takes enormous pride in being able to keep, you know, his institution clean for the people around him. Um, He's just an incredibly, incredibly sweet guy. You know, as you can imagine, actually, after making a murderer happen, people around the globe started sending Brendan letters, you know, and which is one of the incredible things about that series was this kid. And again, I keep saying kid, but, you know, he's a grown <laughs> yeah. man, grown man. Um, <laughs> yeah. This grown man who had never really had a lot of friends before because of his disabilities. You know, suddenly like people all around the globe were sending him these letters saying, I believe in you. I, you know, I feel for you. How are you doing? Hang in there. 
right? You know, hold your head up high. The truth is going to come out. These, these incredible words of encouragement. And, um, and he saved these letters. He was getting like, you know, to this day, he still gets like five or 10 letters every day, getting huge numbers of letters. And he saves these letters. He has for years. He writes back to people as much as he can, you know, just sort of simple words of, of thanks and encouragement. And, you know, it's, he's got this unbelievable like, faith in the justice system and in his fellow man. Yeah. That someday it's going to be made right. And I think that that really, you know, shined through during that interview that he gave. And as we sit here in April 2022, are we any closer to a, to a retrial? We're always closer to a retrial. <laughs> you know, I mean, these cases take way too long, right? I mean, we know this at our center because this is what we do. They can take five years, they can take 10 years, they can take 15 years because the justice system is designed to preserve a conviction almost at any cost. That is by design how our system functions. So when you're trying to write a wrongful conviction, you're pushing you know, a snowball up the mountainside and it literally yeah. gets higher, and, you know, larger and larger and larger and harder to push the further up you go. Um, but you know, someone in Brendan's position still has options. Right. Brendan did already file a clemency petition. We filed a clemency petition with the governor of Wisconsin two years ago. And while that petition was denied, what's encouraging about that process is when we filed that petition, the entire world snapped into action behind Brendan. You know, and that was incredible to see. It's like yeah. so pent up millions of people across the globe who got as pissed off as I did when they watched the <laughs> interrogation videos, just been waiting for a moment, like, what petition can I sign? Where can I, you know, like, who can I tweet at? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And what's incredible, like hundreds of thousands of people signed a petition in support of Brendan Dassey. We had a letter signed by 250 experts on the legal system, on psychology, right? P politicians, you name it. Some of the leading lawyers on the globe signed a letter to Governor Evers saying, this kid needs to go home. We had incredible support up and down inside Wisconsin, outside Wisconsin. And um, you know, the governor denied the petition, but we know because this is a, the kind of work we do that sometimes it takes a little convincing. Yeah. And sometimes it takes filing a petition once, twice, three times. And we've got even more people on our side mm. than we did before. Right. Yeah. So we're here for the long haul. We're here for the fight. Well, good. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's what I like. I to, think yeah. everybody else is too, which yeah. is which is pretty fantastic. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm no legal expert, but my, my feeling with it is, is they almost just don't want to be wrong. It's like look, we'll just we'll keep this going for as long as we can because we don't want to admit actually we made a mistake here. Yeah. Which you know, on one level, is a very human you know reaction. None of but us this is someone's to life. Wrong, but yeah. this is someone's life. That's yeah. right. This is someone's life. This is someone's freedom, you know, especially a kid. And it's just wrong, right? This is why actually a lot of, um, not a lot, but several jurisdictions, a few dozen jurisdictions across the United States have developed things called conviction integrity units, it's basically yeah. watchdogs inside prosecutors' offices, independent watchdogs that are screened off from the rest of the office who are there to, to sort of, you know, respond to people who claim their innocence, who say they've been wrongfully convicted. Some of these conviction integrity units are, are great, like the one in Philadelphia, or the one in, in Detroit. Uh, others are, are less effective, you can imagine, right? It depends yeah, yeah, on the yeah. circumstance. But you need to have people double checking your work when you're dealing with life and death. You know, when you get onto an airplane, right? At least if you're afraid of flying like me and you get onto an airplane, you take great comfort in the fact that you know there's, you know, six mechanics outside with their checklists. You know, the flight attendants have got their checklists and the pilot and the co-pilot have got their checklists. And everybody's triple checking everything because it's that important. And we need to do the same thing in the justice system because it is just as important as, as you know, as getting on the airplane and taking that flight. Yeah. Right. These are people's yeah, yeah. lives. Yeah, of course. And also, you know, like especially with the death penalty, which is still legal in oh. 26 or 27 states in America. I mean, yeah. it doesn't really get more serious than that, does it? You know, so especially even the confessions, because people will be so desperate to get out of the situation, they'll just confess. And I'm, I'm guessing the police will use that as an interrogation tactic. Oh, the debt will threaten them with the death penalty, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's an interrogation tactic, right? If you, you know, the evidence against you is rock solid. And if you don't confess, you're going to get the death penalty. Yeah. Right. That happens. That happens all the time. And you're right. The death penalty is still an enormous problem here. Here in America, there's a woman who people may have heard about right now in Texas who's facing execution at the end of the month, Melissa Lucio, um, who confessed, if you can call it that, to killing her own little girl when the little girl fell down some stairs and, and, and all of forensic evidence indicates that her death was the result of that accidental injury rather than you know this, this abuse that Melissa ended up being forced to confess to just a few hours after she found her little girl dead. It's a horrific story. She's on death row, scheduled for execution and in about three weeks. Um, and the whole, you know, again, the whole community, so many folks, politicians, experts, psychologists, police leaders, right, law enforcement leaders, people are rushing to her support, asking the governor of Texas for clemency in her case. It's as heartbreaking a situation as Brendan. Yeah. Um, and in so many of these cases, the last backstop is, is a governor, right, is a political actor. So you've got to you know, throw the whole world at them. And yeah, of course. Listen, you know. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah exactly. And and over in, in in the UK, it's obviously very very different in terms of how we sort of do things. I don't know how much you know about it. I'm not, you know, massively no, you know, not too much. But what's your what's sort of the the opinion of 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 the British system and and the, and the way that we do things? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I have spent a fair amount of time over there talking to folks about making a murderer about Brendan's case, what wrongful convictions. Um, How did we all treat you? Was it good? Oh <laughs> my God. Was, the trip was phenomenal. <laughs> good, <laughs> right. Sorry. <laughs> you know, it was beautiful. It's beautiful people. <laughs> Not so sure about those, those English breakfasts, but we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, you know, as, as you know, right, England and the UK and Ireland um, had a series of, of problems with false confessions back in yeah. the 70s and 80s right? Um, the Birmingham Six uh, yeah. were a really great example of, of one of those cases. We actually profiled that story on our podcast as well. Um, you know, cases of people falsely confessing. In that case, they were beaten into until they falsely confessed to planting a bomb, right? A couple of bombs in, in Birmingham that, that during the, the troubles. And because of that case and a number of other cases like it that came to a head in, in England in the 70s and 80s, right? A series of reforms were passed there in the 80s, okay? Banning police from lying during interrogation, for example, right? Which we still do here, left, right, and center. Um, that was what you know, the UK did in the 80s. There were other reforms too, right? Uh, a concerned adult has to be present for a child's interrogation. So people like Brendan wouldn't be alone in that room. Right, you know, there's still like any system, right? It can be made better, but but England and the UK went through a huge learning process in the 80s because of the false confessions that came to light. And I'm hopeful that we're actually at, at the start of a similar learning process here. There have been some amazing reforms that, that have passed just in the last year here in the yeah, United great. States. I'm hopeful that we're sort of poised to be in the same situation. Let's talk about Robert Davis, because that's one of the first cases that you worked on that I was reading. He served 22 years in prison um, for a crime he didn't commit. Is that right? He served actually about 13 and a half years in prison. 13 and a half, but he was sentenced. Yeah, Sorry, he yeah. was sentenced to 22, he but he yep, still yep. served 13. Yeah. Could you yeah. please tell people about this story? Because it's absolutely insane and how you came to work on this case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is another one of these, these stories that you know I found life-changing and that that I'll never forget, right? So this is 2003 in Virginia, um, in sh just outside Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where the University of Virginia is. A little town called Crozet, it's February, 2003. And um, Robert is 18 years old, he's a high school senior. It's February, so he's only a few months away from graduation, right? From the end of his high school career and like the life and future that awaits after you graduate from high school. It's February, it's a Saturday night and it's snowing in Crozet, Virginia, right? Robert lives in a little house with his mom on a street called Cling Lane. And on that Saturday night, in the middle of a snowstorm, one of his neighbor's houses goes up in flames, okay? Big fire. The fire department comes, takes them the rest of the night to put out the fire, right? By the morning, though, it's out. And they can go into the house. They go in, they go upstairs, and they find the body of the woman who was the homeowner, Nola Charles. They find her body in a bed. And when they turn her body over, they find a knife in her back. 
Okay. So suddenly it becomes clear that this fire had been set to cover up her murder. Turns out she's been stabbed and beaten badly. Okay. And then down the road in, a, in another bedroom, they find the body of her toddler son who had oh, died God. from smoke inhalation, right? From the fire. Exactly. So it's a terrible, terrible crime. Rocks the small town of Crozet. Pretty soon the police have, have two actually really great suspects, two, um, two, a brother and sister who lived on another house on that same street, right? Who are the same age as the teenage kids of Nola. She had some teenage kids as well as the, as the toddler. They were all friends together and they had a history of getting into trouble together. These, these neighbor kids in particular, um, they really struggled with mental illness, right? Untreated mental illness. They had substance abuse problems and this massive history of you know, violent acts around town. And they really disliked their friend's mom. They really disliked Nola because Nola wouldn't let them all hang out when they wanted to hang out or wear what they wanted to wear, right? That kind of a thing. So they had a grudge against Nola, this brother and sister. Police come in, they, they bring in the brother and sister. They question them, both of them confess, right? They say, yes, we did this. We broke into the house, we stabbed and beat her, we lit the house on fire. And, and they even, these are, these are good confessions, okay? Because they even lead the police to the snow-covered field where th there is this iron bar that's been buried in the snow. And that iron bar has Nola's blood on it. It has her DNA on it. So they're able to lead the police to one of the, the weapons used to attack her. Case closed, these are good confessions. Right. And if that's where the story ended, it really wouldn't be that, that you know, a story that I'm, I'm telling here today. But here's the thing. The police thought more than just those two were involved, more than the brother and sister. And they asked them who else was there. And these two rattle off a list of names of kids from their high school that they didn't get along with. Like five or six names. Oh, all these other people were there, too. The police go down that list of names one by one. Turns out each one of these other kids has an alibi except for the last name, which was Robert Davis, right? The 18 year old who lived on Kling Lane. The police pick up Robert out of the blue at about midnight, uh, not long after this murder happened. They bring him into the interrogation room. He has no idea what's going on. Obviously no parent, no concerned adults, but the whole thing is caught on videotape. The interrogation that's to come is caught on videotape about six and a half hours long from about 2 a.m. until about 8 a.m. He's questioned about this awful killing of his neighbor. And they tell him that they have got his, you know, it's one of the most disturbing interrogation videos I've seen, right? It ranks right up there with Brendan. They tell this 18 year old terrified kid, no record, right? At all, total saint of a kid. They tell him that they found his skin cells at the, the crime scene, his DNA, which is false, right? That house went up in flames, there's no DNA anywhere. They tell him that they found his DNA at the scene and that he is going to get the death penalty unless he confesses, in which case he'll get, they say, three to five years in prison. And they tell him something else, right? They tell him that they found his DNA. And they also tell him that they're not allowed to lie to him, even though that's what they just did. I mean, how is any, anyone, right? How can an adult cope with that level of manipulation, let alone an 18-year-old, right? I mean, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is just not a fair playing field. And, and after about six hours of this, right, Robert, who's trying to explain that he's innocent, trying, he's begging for a polygraph. Can I prove my innocence? How can I show that I wasn't here? No, we have your DNA. We're not allowed to lie about this. You're going to get the death penalty if you keep this up, right? Keep saying that you're innocent. Eventually he agrees to confess, at which point, just like Brandon, he gets the story completely wrong. He has them going in the wrong door to the house. He has the murder happening on the first floor rather than in the upstairs bedroom. He says that he um, beat her when in fact that was the other kids, right? They have to tell him, no, 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 Robert, you stabbed her, right? I and mean, he's got the wrong people there. The whole story is wrong. And just like they had to tell Brendan how Teresa Hallback was killed, they have to tell Robert what happened to Nola Charles, right? And what happened in that house. And he eventually repeats it back. And based on that confession, he is charged with first degree murder as an adult, he's 18 years old. And the judge, just like in Brendan's case, looked at that whole interrogated, that whole videotaped interrogation and says, there's nothing illegal here. Everything they did was legal. And at that point, you know, Robert's staring at a jury trial in a horrible case where, you know, a mother and her son die that he confessed to. And, you know, instead of taking his chances at trial, 
he decided to enter a plea of guilty, a false plea of guilty in, in exchange for a 23 year sentence. This is just a heartbreaker of a case. We got involved many years later um, when a local newspaper published an article about the story, which is how we read about it, just online, right? It yeah, popped yeah, up yeah. in our feed and um, reached out to Robert. Turns out his lawyer who'd, who had uh, you know, represented him at the time always believed in his innocence. A tremendous lawyer named Steve Rosenfield had stayed in touch with Robert, had pledged to always do whatever he could to prove Robert's innocence. He had received letters recently from the brother and sister who were also convicted, right? Who by that point had spent seven or eight years in prison, realized what they did to Robert and recanted everything they said about what he did, right? They wrote these letters to the lawyer saying, oh my God, now we know that it was wrong to <laughs> falsely implicate him. And we know what prison is like now. And you know, you need to know he had nothing to do with this. We got involved after those letters came forward. We wrote a big analysis of this confession showing why it was false. We got law enforcement authorities involved who also weighed in and said this, this confession is garbage. International authorities, some, some leading experts from the UK weighed in, all kinds of folks. Um, there was even a Dateline NBC episode that was made about it as well to tell the story. And finally, after, after years of putting together this advocacy package and waiting, um, the governor of Virginia, Governor Terry McAuliffe, pardoned Robert Davis on the basis of actual innocence. Um, and Robert got to go home. Um, which oh, is one so of the good. Most incredible, amazing, yeah. incredible things to, to see and witness, <clears throat> right? But it takes that long and it takes, it really does in every case, it takes an incredible conglomeration of people. Um, you know, it worked for Robert, it's worked for others, it will work for Brendan. Hmm. It will work for Brendan. And this is why what you do is so important. This is what it's all about when they leave. Yeah. We know when, like when Robert it. must have come out, you, I can't even imagine that feeling you know, for you, when you're involved in that case so closely to see him come out and you've, your, your job's, you know, your job's done there. I mean, that's the thing, right? It's like when you're in these cases, you get to know this person so well because you're in a foxhole together for maybe a decade, right? Yeah. And you live those highs and lows together and you become, you can become so close, almost like family, right? Which is one of the beautiful things about this space. I mean, I'm still in close touch with Robert to this day. Right. Um, and, and many of the other people that I've been lucky enough to call my clients have now become my friends. Some of them, my colleagues who speak out themselves against wrongful convictions, who have taken on their own projects, their own nonprofits that they've started to help other wrongfully incarcerated people. It's just incredible the, the you know, the belief that, that they have in you as their advocate and that you have in them as somebody who is deserving of help and who's yeah. been wrong. You know, yeah. those are bonds that, that can last a lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, Laura, thank you so much for this. It's been brilliant. I've loved talking to you. I really do appreciate your time. And um, for people who want to connect with the Wrongful Convictions Center, if they want to um, get in touch, if they want to try and find information on Brendan and how they can help Brendan be released, where, where can they where can they find this? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Laura Nyrider. So that should be easy enough. And you can also <laughs> learn more about our center at www.centeronwrongfulconvictions.org. Amazing. Thank you so much. Loved it. Oh, thank you, James. <laughs> My pleasure. Great chat. All right. Great chat. Cheers, Laura. Take care. See you. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.